Today, I will be presenting in this webinar showing how to process shallow seismic data in the Zond ST2D program. ST in the name of the program stands for seismic tomography. And refraction tomography is the main purpose of this program. But beside the refraction, we can also process data of MASW, HVSR, and borehole seismic methods. So this webinar is generally an introduction to the software. I will be working on three different projects, refraction, MASW, and downhole survey. And I will show you how to import multiple shot records, set up survey geometry, pick first arrivals, work with travel time curves and dispersion imagery, and perform data inversion. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat. And at the end of the webinar, I will try to answer them. So let's begin with the presentation. So this is the main window of the program, which is used mostly for modeling and tomographic inversion. Seismic field data are processed in a separate module, which is called Trace Editor. The module is opened by clicking on this icon. I will start with a small MASW project. So let's open the data files. Here in the open dialog box, there are three options. We can open the data files in SegWay or Seg2 formats. We can open an existing project file, and you can also import your DSP data. So for the MSW project, I have eight shot records in the SegWay format. I can select them all and open them all at once. So at the toolbar here, there, there is a list of files opened here in the project and you can switch between them by selecting the files in this list. Also, you can use this floating toolbar to switch between your shot records. In the data display window, you can change the scaling by using the zoom tool like this. You can zoom in on any portion of the data and you can also move your shot records within this window. To rescale, to adjust the gains of the shot records, there are a few ways to do this. You can either click on this gain header in the table, left click to increase the gains, right click to decrease the gains. You can input values in the table like so. And note, if this checkbox here is activated, all the changes made in this table are also applied to all shot records down the list. Uh, another way to adjust gains is just uh, do it trace by trace by using your mouse wheel, like so. Or you can select a range of traces and increase or decrease the gains again using the mouse wheel. You can change the orientation of the shot records. Sorry, wrong button. Like this for those who are used to vertical display. You can show the data in the variable density mode like this. 
and also we can change the colors of the legal traces basically you can assign any colors to the to the traces like this so this survey was performed using a land streamer arrangement which means that the whole array, including the source for each shot location, is moved a certain distance along the survey line. So as you can see, all the shot records, they have the same source to receiver offset. Uh, the geometry for your survey is specified in this table and also in these input boxes here. As you can see, there are all zeros here, so the geometry is not specified. And now I'll show you how to assign the geometry to your data. So this survey was conducted using a 24 channel system with two meters spacing between the dual phones. So the first, for the first shot record, the position of the first dual phone was zero. And now we only need to input the increment for the rest of the receivers. And now we have the spread that goes from zero to 46. And again, note that this checkbox here is activated. These changes in the table applied to all consecutive shot records. And the source location is input in this input box here. We had a shot offset of six meters from the first dual phone. So I'm, I input minus six here in this field. And now, since it's a land streamer array, we need to apply an increment to the whole array. This is done by using this command, increment to array. So the move up of the array along the line was six meters. And now you can see that all the coordinates of receivers and sources are incremented by six meters. So this is how we can easily set up the survey geometry. And there's a schematic of the survey design here in the array tab. This red triangle indicates the source location and the blue triangles indicate the receivers. So if you go through your data, you can see that the, the highlighted triangles change their position accordingly. So for the MSW, basically all you need to do is to set up the geometry and after that you can process your data. If you want to assess the P wave velocities, you can use this velocity approximation tool to see what kind of velocities you have for refraction. The velocity values that are measured are displayed here in the status bar. For now, it was measured as 1.83 kilometers per second. So now let's uh, go to the MSW module. So this is the MSW module. Uh, again, there is a list of the shot records here in the toolbar. You can also switch between them using these arrow buttons. On the top here, there is a survey design schematic. This red dot is the source position. The blue dots are the receiver positions, and these triangles here are MSW data points. Usually, the location of MSW data point is assigned to the midpoint of the receiver array. So we have a total of eight points here. This is the dispersion image display, and here on the right, we have the data display. 
Sometimes you need to specify a range of traces that are used for the calculation of the dispersion image. Uh, as you can see right now, we have three traces at the end disabled. You can specify the range of traces in this processing tab. These two input boxes, minimum offset and maximum offset. Specify the, um, the range of traces that you want to use. For example, if I input 10 and 100, here, and if I go back to the data display, you see that first two traces were disabled because their offsets were six and eight. And these three traces at the end uh, have appeared. Uh, you can also manually disable and enable the traces one by one by double clicking on the traces. Also, you can disable or enable a whole range of traces like this. So for this survey, we don't need to specify a specific trace range because it was a short spread and uh, the source offset was quite good, it was six meters. And also in this processing tab, you can specify the velocity range for the dispersion image as well as the frequency range. For example, for this image, one kilometer per second is probably too much, so I'm gonna change it to 0.7. I can then change it to 0.6. And you can also specify the frequency range like this. Now, for the dispersion image, there are several uh, spectra options that you can display. First, this, uh, these four buttons on the toolbar will display the different spectra. A and A2, these are amplitude spectra calculated the classic phase shift transform. The PF is, is typically used with the refraction micro tremor or passive data. This spectrum is calculated using a slant step transform. Uh, it's not very good for active acquisition, so only you're typically used only for the passive data. And finally, the ES button shows the special autocorrelation spectrum. This can be used in both active and passive acquisition, but I think usually most often is, it is used with passive data. A and A2, they are basically the same amplitude spectra, uh, but A2 is the spectrum of squared amplitude, it's just more contrasting. Now, let's go to the picking of the dispersion curves. You can pick the dispersion curves manually just by clicking in the dispersion image, or you can use several tools for the semi-automatic picking. For example, these two tools, they will perform the picking in the, in the circular or square window. You can change the size of the window using the mouse wheel. And then you just click on your dispersion image and the points are picked automatically. Also, you can smooth your picked curve by pressing this button here. Another option for picking is using this a rectangular selection. You can just stretch the rectangle and the program will perform the search for the maximum amplitudes. So right now I'm going to pick all the dispersion images. If the data are good, 
then this process is very fast. Also, we have an option to pick either fundamental mode or two higher modes. Right now, I'm picking the fundamental mode because I don't really see any higher modes in this data. But if there were any, we could have picked them. They just appear as peaks of different colors, like so. So, few more images to pick. And the last one. So, after you pick the dispersion curves, we can go to the inversion module. So, in the inversion module, there is again the same list of the shot records here and the same arrow buttons to switch between the shot records. On the top here, this is the cross section of shear wave velocities. These triangles here indicate the location of the MSW data points. On the bottom left, this curve is the picked curve. This red line is the calculated curve, and the blue line is the interactive model. For the model, we can change the velocities and we can change depth like this. And also we can make the changes in this tabulated model here. For the program settings, we can specify your starting model for example, you, have, you can set the thickness of the first layer, the number of layers, and the thickness increment for the layers. Also, you can set up the limits for the for your shear wave velocity here in this in these two input boxes. You can choose a inversion algorithm. We have three options here. You can choose the number of iterations. And for now, for the starting model, there's only an option to set a single velocity. So I just try to choose the starting velocity close to the values of the dispersion curve. So I'm going to set it to 0 0.2. The velocities here are in kilometers per second. And now the inversion starts by clicking on this button here. So for the first data point, the inversion is complete. You have an option to copy the inversion model and then paste it into another data point and then use it as a starting model for the inversion. You can also run the inversion for the complete data set by right clicking on this button. So right now the program will automatically invert the whole data set. So here in the toolbar, you have an option to invert the fundamental mode. And after this inversion is done, you can include higher modes into inversion. Also, we can choose to invert either Rayleigh wave here or like love wave. Okay, now I have some problem with this point. Not sure what's going on here. All right, I'll run the inversion again for this one. I'm not sure what happened with this. I'll try to copy the model into this one here.
sorry, Lia, you, you should talk on uh, first mode to do inversion for first mode. Now it's just for fundamental mode. Yes, I'm trying to invert the fundamental. It's checkbox. Uh, it's M1 checkbox to, be, to, to, to make this inversion. Or is, is this? Oh, I'm sorry. I accidentally picked the wrong mode. That's for. Yes, I guess for the couple of the curves, I picked the higher mode accidentally. So I'm just going to delete this one and the next one and go back to fundamental and we pick the curve like so and finally this one i uh, thank you alex for the tip i wouldn't be able to figure out this by myself so now it's all good we pick the only the fundamental mode I go back to the to these two and run the inversion. Yes, and as I've seen at any time during the inversion process, you can go back to the MSW processing module and uh, repeat your curves if you like to, and go back to the inversion module and rerun the inversion. Also, if you are doing a one dimensional sounding where you have only one stationary spread and several shot locations, you might want to merge the dispersion curves. There's a small module that is doing the curve merging. So these are all eight of our picked dispersion curves. You can delete some of the curves you don't want to merge, or you can disable some pick points. And this button calculates the average dispersion curve, this black, black bold line. And uh, so after that, this average dispersion curve can be copied into, exported into dispersion image and then inverted. And also the same thing you can do with the models. Uh, there is a merging models module where you can just calculate an average of all of your inversion modules like this, and then export the result. So this is the resulting cross section of shear wave velocities. And after the inversion is complete, you can export your results. You can export you can export them as individual models to different file formats, or you can also export the the cross section. So this concludes the short introduction to the MASW processing. I will now go to the Refraction project. For this, uh, to save us some time, I will not be importing any data files. I will just open an existing project here. So, this project, I have nine shot records here acquired using a single stationary 48 channel spread with two meter spacing between the geophones. As you can see, the geometry is already set up. So our spread is from zero to 94 meters. And we have shot locations at different uh, points within the spread. So this area tab again shows the schematic. Uh, the red highlighted diamond indicates the shot location. Also, as you can see, uh, the first arrivals are already picked. So what I'm going to do now, I will just remove a few picks here 
and I'll show you how to pick first arrivals. So for picking, for picking, you can do it manually just by clicking on the shot record, or you can use an automatic picking mode. Uh, the automatic picking mode performs a search for a pick point in this circular window. The size of the window can be adjusted using the mouse wheel. So you can select what kind of point you want to pick. You can pick a, the onset or uh, the maximum or minimum amplitudes. So basically when you just click here on the first arrivals, the program automatically detects uh, the onsets uh, in this case. And to further facilitate the picking, you can use another tool which performs the picking in this kind of area. Then this size of the area is controlled by the mouse wheel, like so. So this is how it's done. If the data are good, then this automatic picking performs reasonably well. But sometimes you still need to correct some picks. And you need to correct some picks manually. especially if the data are noisier. So you can copy your current peak and then paste it into another shot record. This can uh, facilitate your picking, especially in the case with some areas of your data are noisy and the onsets are not clear, this can improve the your picks. So this is basically how the picks are picked. Now the travel time curves are plotted in the Photographs tab here. There are two ways to plot the travel time curves. First, you can plot them using source locations on the source coordinates on the x axis. This is a more conventional way of displaying the travel time curves. Here you can check how the how the refracted waves are parallel between the shot records. And another way to plot the travel time curves is to use offsets on the X axis. So in this type of display, it's very easy to control the reciprocity. Uh, so for these shot records, all of them were obtained within the spread. So for each trail time curve, we have eight reciprocal points. These reciprocal points are indicated with blue dots here. I'm not sure how clear you can see them on your screen, but when you pick any, when you select any trail time curve, there will be a corresponding uh, reciprocal point on another curve. Right? And here I can see that there's a bit of discrepancy here between the reciprocal points. So this has to be corrected because theoretically these reciprocal points, they should have the same arrival time. And now I, those Trail down curves that I just picked, they are not that smooth 
as the rest of them, but because the rest of them were smoothed pre previously. So I'm just going to smooth, oops, shouldn't have done that. I'm going, going to smooth these two travel anchors like so. And uh, so now typically what you do, you just go and check any discrepancies that you see between the reciprocal points. These reciprocal points, they're also indicated here in the data display window. You can see these larger green dots here. These are reciprocal points on other trail time curves. So ideally you need to align your peak to with the reciprocal points here. Um, so the process looks like you just go and correct all the peaks based on the this reciprocity analysis. And after that, if there is some still still some discrepancy between the reciprocal points, uh, this can be corrected either by correcting this the start time, time zero of some of the trail time curves or uh, shot records. In the case when the when the discrepancy is constant, but I don't see any constant discrepancy here, so. What I'm going to do, I will just average the reciprocity data so that the, the times of the reciprocal points, they're just averaged. And now you can see that all the reciprocal points are, they coincide perfectly. So next thing I will do, I will collect the amplitude data. For this, you don't have to pick the maximum amplitudes. The program can collect amplitudes automatically in a window. In the collect settings dialog box here, you can specify to collect the amplitudes either after the peak points or around the peak points. Around the peak points option is used when you pick the maximum amplitude. And since we picked the onsets, we will use the after pick point option. Uh, and we need to specify this uh, window, search window here. This window is specified in samples. So we need to check first uh, what sampling window do we need. The the position of the cursor on the data display is indicated here in the status bar. Here you can see the time sampling sample number and also the amplitude value. So I just checking that we probably need around 20 samples to perform this search. So I put 20 here and after that, we can just use this command, collect amplitudes from all shots. And now we can display the amplitude peaks here. So these are the peaks of the plots of our collected amplitudes. Uh, now I'm going to the MSW module and I just want to obtain some shear rate velocity models from the MSW shots. And just set up some trace ranges here. So what I'm going to do, I will obtain the shear wave velocity model, one dimensional models from first five shot records so that we have a um, one dimensional model uh, at various locations along the, li along the line spaced evenly. So I'm just going to 
pick five dispersion curves very quick. Like so. Again, if your dispersion imagery is good, the picking process is very simple in this program. Nope. And the last one here. Like so, so now I'm going to invert this data. I'm just going to use pretty much the default settings for this and run the quick conversion. After that, I will save the inversion results as one dimensional models. And later, I will show you how to incorporate these data into your refraction results. So, inversion is done. I'm going to export the models as one dimensional models in the mod 1D format. Now I'm going to close I'm going to close the MSW module. And now we're going back to the main window of the program to perform the refraction inversion. And this is done by clicking on this button here. So when you enter the main window, the first thing you need to do is to set up the mesh or the grid. The program automatically uh, detects your survey design and suggests that grid. Basically, uh, there is a, a node in the grid for every geoform location, but you can make the denser grid if you prefer. And also, also you can pretty much choose any type of layering for your vertical grid in this area here. But I will just go with the default settings. So here on the top, the black lines are peaked travel time curves. And the red lines are the travel time curves calculated from this model on the bottom. There are several, there are three modeling modes in STTD. This is the match mode where the model is represented as a mesh. Then there is a layered model where the subsurface is represented by a set of discrete layers. And finally, there is a polygon modeling mode where you can uh, specify your model as a set of polygons. But this this modeling mode is rarely used. So here we can start the inversion right away, but usually you want to specify a good starting model. There are a few ways to do this. I will just show one of them. There is yet another module here in the program, which is a classic layered inversion module where you can specified layers by marking the by marking the points on your travel time curves like so and based on this slant of uh, the travel time curves this is very tedious process so i'm not gonna do this right now and the program also has a automatic mode for this where you can only specify a number of layers basically I'm just marking uh, the latest arrival time as as a fourth layer and then 
I'm gonna run the automatic inversion. So and this is the result of the inversion so that you can correct this uh, if you want. Now there is also a fully automatic mode without specifying any layering. So if I do the fully automatic inversion, the program detects three layers here. And I'm not going to do thorough interpretation of this data. I'm just going to go with the automatic inversion model. What you can do with this model now, you can set this model, export it to layering model mode here. And also these boundaries can be exported as a priori boundaries. The a priori boundaries are used to constrain the inversion. You can pretty much specify any boundary you want, and then the inversion algorithm will use this boundary as, as a constraint for the inversion. Uh, for example, if you have uh, bore, some boreholes along your survey line, and you might want to specify some contrasting boundaries. So here, again, I'm not sure how well can you see this, these thin black lines here, you are exported from that layered processing module. There are two boundaries. So these are now set as a priori boundaries. And also if I go to the layered mode, uh, this is the exported imported model from the layered inversion. Now, and what we can do now, we can export this layered model into the mesh. And now our mesh model will look like this. And we can use this model as a starting model. Now to check how the how well the starting model fits your data, you can solve the forward problem by clicking on this button here. And you can see the misfit of the inversion here is 3.6, the RMS error, which is not bad, but definitely we can improve this by running the tomographic inversion. Uh, now, I'm just for the program settings. Uh, you can choose between five different inversion algorithms. You can select the number of iteration you can run. You can specify the limits for the inverted velocity. Also, you can perform some operations with the model like cell grouping, or these options are used to control the smoothness of the model. I'm just, uh, I'll just choose some inversion settings here. And after that, we can run the inversion by clicking on this button here. So the inversion is complete, and this is our inversion model. The RMS error for this inversion was 1.4, which is a good number. Uh, there are a few ways to display your model. You can display it as a smooth section, or you can display it as a contour section. You can also play with the color scales here, like so. Now I'm going to uh, perform the inversion of amplitudes. I'm showing the attenuation data here. So these are the peaked amplitude values. Usually for the amplitudes, you want to smooth these data because initially they are not very smooth. I'm going to apply some smoothing to these curves. And after that, we can run the inversion for the amplitudes. Mm -hmm. 
And now this is the resulting attenuation cross section. And we're going to scale better. So, it, so it, as you can see, the maximum attenuation happens close to the surface, apparently at the water table. And now going back to the velocity cross section. You can display uh, the rate paths calculated for the inversion model, the theoretical rate paths. Uh, so these, these lines are the theoretical rate paths. And also you can trim your model so that the model only shows the portion of it that that has some rate paths. And now for the MSW data that we have processed, you can import this data from the file that I saved uh, in the form of the columns. So these columns, the color in them indicate the shear wave velocity. So this is how the MSW data can be incorporated into your results. And finally, we can display this summary plot here where you can display three three cross sections which could be your velocity model e wave velocity model on the top here this is the attenuation model on the bottom and also you can show the interpolated shear wave velocities from the msw or you can show the calculated elastic moduli so this is it for the refraction portion of the presentation. And now the last project that I have is the downhole survey. <clears throat> so I'm going to open new data again. So the downhole survey was this data, this data were acquired using a three component borehole geoform. And uh, the borehole was 58 meters deep and the depth increment was one meter. So we have a depth point at every one meter. So there are 58 depth Point, depth points. And uh, at each depth, there are two shot records acquired with uh, opposite directions of the source. I have sorted these shots into two folders. So in the first folder, designated as plus, we have the shots that were acquired uh, one with one direction of the source. And in the second folder, there are the shots that are acquired using the opposite direction of the sort of the source. I will just open one of one of the shot records here to show you how it looks like. So we have three traces here. Uh, channel one. Channel one was the vertical sensor. So it records the P wave. This is the P wave arrival here. And these two channels, channel two and channel three, uh, 
These were horizontally oriented sensors, so they are recording shear wave arrivals here. So let's import the whole data set. Right now I'm selecting the VSP data here, which is basically the same data files in Segway or Seg2 formats, but program just using a different uh, importing algorithm for this data. After we import this data, we have this sorting window. On the left, we have a column with the file names. And these three columns on the right, these are our three channels. So as I said, the first channel was the vertical channel. Here in ST2D, the vertical channel is designated as Z and horizontal channels are designated as X and Y. Uh, this column here is depth. So the first depth was at 58 meters and the increment was one meter. So I changed all the depth so that they go from 58 to one here. And this column here designates the, the direction of the source. So right here, this will be our plus source direction. And this input box is the offset of the source from the mouth of the borehole. In our case, it was two meters. So now we have three seismographs here. They're designated as X plus, Y plus, and Z plus. By default, the program sorts the traces by file names for some reason. So we need to resort the traces by depth. Uh, so these are now the properly looking uh, DSP seismograms. Now I'm gonna import the second set of our data acquired using the opposite source direction. Um, I'm going to do the same thing basically. So this will be Z channel X and Y and the same depth range. And here I select the source direction as minus. So now we have six seismograms. We have X plus and X minus, Y plus and Y minus, and Z plus and Z minus. So let's have a look at the data. Some people process the downhole survey results in this vertical display, but I prefer to do it in the horizontal display the same way as refraction. So this is the X component with one source direction, and this is the X component with, component acquired with another source direction. As you can see, these arrivals here they don't they don't change polarity so these are these arrivals are not polarized so apparently these are ip wave arrivals and also these arrivals here they do not change polarity as well so apparently these arrivals are the tube wave that is generated that was generated on the water table Uh, so, and you can see by switching between these seismograms that the polarization happens somewhere around here, but we don't see the clear onset because the tube wave and the P wave arrivals, they are uh, contaminating, contaminating the record. Uh, the same thing for the Y component. 
but these data on this sensor are not very good. This is why this sensor was not oriented very well towards the source. So I'm not going to use this component. I will just remove these two seismograms. seismograms. I'm going to work on the, on the X component and Z component. Now, for the shear wave, we need to do a subtraction. This can be done in the operations tab here. Uh, there is a list of different shot records or seismograms, and by choosing some of them, kind of overlay one seismogram on another. And as you can see, then if I increase the, the gains a little bit, here, here for these arrivals and here, there is no polarization. So this for shear wave, this is considered noise. And the polarization happens somewhere in this area. You know, some people will pick uh, pick the shear wave variables right here, but I would advise not to do that. I would advise to perform the subtraction of this data. This can be easily done in the operations tab. This button here now uh, with the minus sign will perform the subtraction. Uh, the subtracted seismograph is recorded into a new uh, seismogram. And now let's see how it looks like. I'm just going to increase the gains a little bit. So this is this is the original seismogram designated as plus. This is the minus, and this is the, result, the resulting seismograph, the subtracted one. And as you can see, the the non-polarized non -polarized arrivals are adequately subtracted. So now we see the clear onset for the shear wave. And uh, for the for the P wave, you can stack those two seismograms acquired with the opposite source directions, they generally they show the same uh, same level and polarization and time. So you don't need to do this, but the stacking these two seismograms probably will improve the signal to noise ratio a little bit. So this button here will stack these two seismograms. And now we have two resulting seismograms. One is the subtracted shear wave, and the other one is the stacked uh, P wave. Now we can pick the arrivals pretty much the same way as we do with the refraction. Uh, to save us some time again, I'm not going to do this. I will just open an existing project with already picked arrival times. So again, see this is the basically the same data I just uh, picked it beforehand, and uh, when you have both P wave and S wave data in your project, you have to assign uh, these to your picks. So if you're picking S way, you have to select S here in this menu. And for the P wave, you have to assign the P wave here in the menu. And now there is a simple inversion module for the downhole service, which is called BSP module. Uh, just to remind you, VSP stands for vertical 
seismic profiling, but commonly it's called dial fault survey. So here, this the red and blue dotted lines are calculated average velocity calculated from the peaks, and these lines, red and blue lines, are inversion models. Uh, usually, uh, you first perform the inversion separately for the shear wave data and P wave data, like this. And after that, you can do the joint inversion of the two models. So this is the joint inversion result, uh, which you can then export to a CSV file or a one-dimensional drawing model. And that's it for the presentation. Uh, I will now turn off the screen sharing and we'll see if you have any questions. I'll try to answer some questions for you. Sorry, Leah, uh, there is one question about uh, data stacking. You can show uh, now because it's important question as, as I think. So please do, do, do not stop sharing your screen. Okay. Uh, yes, I've seen this question. So the stacking of the short records or seismograms. So I just, I have just shown two options for this. So I actually, I need to open the data again. I guess I will, I will open probably the refraction project, or maybe I just open a few NSW data files like this. So for the stacking, so this data were acquired with uh, different source positions. But the idea will be the same. For example, let's imagine that we have two shot records obtained uh, using the same source location, like this one and this one. And we want to stack them to uh, improve the signal to noise ratio. So, first, you uh, enable the display of one of them, then you go to the operation operation tab here and uh, you can select all the uh, traces opened here in the project or only those that have the same source like this and when you select any of the shot records you can see these two shot records will be overlaid like the original one is the wiggle traces a field and uh, the second one, the secondary shot record is displayed as those thin uh, red lines. So these are two shot records that we can then stack. This is done by just simply selecting this, the desired shot record in the list and then pressing the button uh, to stack. So there are two options, you can stack them or you can subtract them. So when you stack, uh, there is a new file that will be the result of the uh, adding one shot record to another. So this is how the stacking is performed. Now, I don't know how to... Okay, I guess I will stop screen sharing right now. And if I need to, I will share it again to answer other questions. Let's see if uh, you guys have any questions. 
there is a question from Samuel, yet another one. How to know if there is error in the trigger time and then how to correct? This is a good question. So I'm just going to do the screen sharing again. And I will show you on uh, the same project I used before on the refraction project. Now we'll just open the refraction project here. This is the one. So the way you recognize if you have a problem with your trigger is done by controlling the reciprocity. As I've shown you before in the in the travel time curve display, you can see your reciprocal points. For for example, for this highlighted travel time curve, there are eight reciprocal points here, 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 and here. And these reciprocal points they should have the same time. But for example, if if your trigger time is not right, your picking will be shifted. And you will need to you then kind of recognize that this is a time shift that occurred probably because of the faulty trigger. And you can either use this command here to correct start time of your shot records, but then I think it might be the program might try to correct them for the start time for all of the curves, but I'm not sure again. Or you can just do it manually by adjusting the start time here in this input box. For example, if I input another value here, you can see that the peak, the trail time curve is shifted. So this is how you correct your start times in in ST2D. Uh, thank you very much, Ilya. It was very interesting, and we have uh, another few questions. Uh, they mostly about in inversion. Uh, Alexei Shulgin asking about how we could incorporate uh, boundaries to, to the inversion uh, a priori information. The same question we received from Samuel uh, about this a priori information and uh, borehole information. Yes, this is very important. Uh, to use this a priori information during inversion, and especially if it's uh, involved right in the mathematical process of inversion. So if you have a boring hole data, like just geological information, you can only use boundaries you've seen on your boring hole. So you can incorporate uh, these boundaries and I think it's referred to the question of Alexei. Um, I, I should say sorry that I, I couldn't uh, share my screen because um, in my district, uh, we still have ADSL internet connection and it's very, very slow. So um, I, I just can uh, refer you to, to the public chat of this webinar, uh, where is I shared three videos on uh, how to incorporate borehole information uh, to the inversion and boundaries and ERT, how to do a joint inversion between ERT and refraction seismic data. Um, <clears throat> I think this uh, videos could help you if you uh, will have uh, another questions on this topic. We can discuss it uh, personally because I, I just checked my uh, con uh, connection to internet and it's very low now. Uh, so I'm sorry. Um, 
and another stuff about uh, this uh, borehole data when you're trying to use an inversion. Another way to incorporate uh, a priori information into inversion is using logging. If you have a logging, uh, like resistivity logging for RT inversion or uh, velocity logging for seismic inversion, you can uh, incorporate it uh, in the inversion as a starting model or like a range for some cells. But maybe it will be not successful every time because if you arrange uh, some cells uh, in inversion, it could uh, distort your uh, final image because you uh, took information from logging and it's not so integrate uh, like uh, surface seismic data. So you, you, you couldn't uh, uh, resolve for so uh, rapid boundaries and velocity in like in logging. Uh, I hope it helped. Thank you. If you have another questions, please hands up. I'm just going to add to this that in the ST2D, there is a, a, a good module for creating the borehole logs where you can easily specify the lithology and place uh, borehole columns on your cross section. And well, the same way as I have imported the MSW 1D models, you can show the borehole logs here in the cross section. Let's imagine these are our borehole columns or logs. Also, these could be um, any plots of geophysical logging. And again, to specify a priori boundaries, you can just plot the boundary using the borehole logs like this and then use this boundary to constrain the inversion, use it as a priori boundary. This is how it's done. Yeah, we have another question uh, again from so For the MSW, I don't think there is uh, a joint inversion of the MSW and refraction data. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, a little in incorrect because uh, for uh, arbitrary layered inversion, where it's also layered but arbitrary layered uh, uh, model, uh, yes, we can use. Yes. yes, indeed. Yes, I was wrong. Absolutely. So I'm going to share the screen again. Oh, sorry, but I, I, I was asking about pre previous question. I, I, I sent it to, to your Skype box. Uh, it's from Samuel again. It's I think it's very important about filtering. Yes, I will address this after. I will address this after the previous question. So, in the tomographic, uh, in the mesh modeling mode, you cannot do the joint inversion of the MSW and refraction data. But in the layered mode, I'm just going to remove those. Oops. I'm just going to remove those. Quick. In the layered mode, uh, you can perform the joint inversion. So if you have the, the interpolated cross section with your MSW data, and then you can just check this uh, checkbox here to invert MSW, and then the inversion algorithm will perform the joint inversion of the two velocity models. And uh, for the question, uh, again from Samuel, when we apply filter, how do you know if we're not deleting the real data? It's a good question again. So there are a few filtering options here in the program. Well, the main of them is basically just uh, uh, the frequency filtering. So when you apply a filter, uh, 
the problem will show you the filter data. And the thing is that uh, the program stores two, uh, in the project, the program stores two uh, seismograms for each shot. One is unprocessed or raw shot record, and the other one is processed. So uh, to, this is the filtered data now, and to return to the unprocessed data, you just click this uh, icon here that clears all the processing. There is no way to control, unfortunately. Uh, you don't, you cannot tell if these data were processed. You can only tell this by, just by looking at them, but the program never deletes the original data. So you can always return to your original data by clicking on this icon. Uh, make a pause for now. I'm going to read another question. Uh, there is a question from Mahmoud. So for the MASW acquisition, what would be the best spacing between the geophones? Well, this will depend on your target depth because the depth of penetration for surface wave, wave depends on the size of the array. So for example, if you are using a spread which is only 20 meters long, the effective depth of penetration will be about half of the size, so it will be about 10 meters. And if you use a spread of 100 meters, so theoretically you can uh, reach to a depth of 50 meters if you're using an appropriate source. But for larger spreads, uh, you need a really good source or you can use, you can collect passive data. The passive data typically uh, shows much lower frequencies, so uh, you can get to greater depth with the passive data. So uh, concluding uh, the answer to this question, the optimal spacing will depend on your target depth. And also it's a good, good approach to use variable spacing. Like if, if you need to collect both shallow and deep data, then either you use uh, two spreads of different size, for example, with one meter spacing between geophone, collect the shallow data, and then you switch to a larger spread that will be say 80 or 100 meters, and then you collect the deep data and then you process this, uh, these two spreads as like one dimensional sounding and combine the results. Another good approach is to use variable spacing within one spread, which is, for example, first 10 channels uh, are spaced with a spacing, say one meter, and the rest of your geophones are spaced like say five meters or so. I hope this answers this and um...